we can go live on YouTube. Uh, all right. And uh, I think uh, uh, let us start. Okay. So uh, again, uh, a very good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, well, again, depending on whichever part of the world we're logging in from today. And uh, it's, it's uh, so delightful to have uh, Professor uh, Subir uh, Sachdev today as our distinguished speaker as part of the, uh, the Mysteries of the Universe Institute Lecture Series Part 2, the second installment at the Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki, IIT Rurki. And um, uh, if one may recall some of us, uh, it, uh, probably that uh, as was uh, advertised uh, before the first uh, uh, talk by Professor Tony Leggett way back, I mean, not so way back, but in Jan on Jan 9th, a uh, couple of months ago, this part two of the MOU ILS is actually a collaboration of uh, Professor T.V. Ramakrishnan and myself. So it was basically a collaboration of kinetic matter physics and string theory. And uh, I, I, I uh, really cannot think of a, of a better person uh, effecting that uh, collaboration uh, in terms of uh, uh, the kind of uh, work that uh, he does than Professor Subir Sachdev. So for a more formal introduction, uh, Professor Sachdev is the Herschel Smith Professor of Physics at Harvard uh, and uh, the Perimeter Research Chair and the Distinguished Visiting Research Chair at the Perimeter Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics. Uh, quoting from his 2018 uh, Dirac Medal citation, uh, Professor Sachdev has made uh, pioneering contributions to many areas of theoretical kinetic matter physics. Of particular importance uh, were the development of the theory of quantum critical phenomena in insulators, superconductors, and metals, the theory of spin liquid states of quantum antiferromagnets, and the theory of fractional, fractionalized phases of matter, the study of novel uh, deconfinement phase transitions, the theory of quantum matter without quasi particles, and the application of many of these ideas to a priori unrelated problems in black hole physics. Uh, so that is the connection that I was referring to. Uh, including a concrete model of non-Fermi liquids. He has a long list of awards and uh, honors, and uh, they include, uh, as I've already mentioned, the Dirac Medal uh, given by the International Center for Theoretical Physics, Trieste, in 2018. Uh, the same year, he was awarded the Lars on Sager Prize by the APS, that is the American Physical Society. Uh, he received the Dirac Medal for the Advancement of Theoretical Physics, which is awarded by the Australian Institute of Physics, the University of New South Wales and the Royal Society of New South Wales in 2015. Uh, he um, was uh, elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in April 2014, uh, became a fellow of the APS in 2001. And going way back to 1983, uh, he uh, was the recipient of the, uh, the Leroy Apker Award given by the APS. This is uh, as uh, way back as 1983. And I read the citation uh, for his accomplishments as an undergraduate student at MIT, including his research, uh, quantum electrodynamics in a damped cavity. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he became an honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2019, and also a foreign fellow of the International Science Academy in 2019. So with that, I would request uh, Professor Sachdev uh, to please uh, deliver your lecture. Professor Sachdev, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mishra. Uh, it's a real honor for me to uh, to be here at this Mysteries of the Universe series, and uh, I hope uh, things are going well in Rurki, and I hope someday to visit there in person. Uh, but uh, we'll have to do in these times with uh, a Zoom presentation. So let's see. Oh gosh, what happened to my? Excuse me a minute. Uh, just one second. No problems. Actually, no problem. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Now I share again. My mouse seemed to have disappeared, but I think it should be here now. Right. All right. So, uh, so thank you again, Professor Mishra. So let me get started. Uh, and uh, I hope you can all hear me well and uh, see the screen and see the green circle, uh, my pointer. All right. Uh, so as Professor Mishra mentioned, uh, my talk uh, will be about a, a remarkable connection between condensed matter physics, which is the field I've, of my PhD and the field I've worked on for many years, uh, and uh, problems in black hole physics. 
Uh, and uh, so let me just uh, set the stage. So well, formally stated, a remarkable connection has emerged in modern physics between A, uh, the quantum theory of many interacting particles, uh, you know, electrons in various materials and crystals, especially the ones that were discovered uh, in the 1980s. And remarkably, uh, a completely unrelated problem of the quantum theory of black holes. Uh, so why would this connection be so astonishing? Well, at the very basic fact, uh, when we are starting up electrons moving in a crystal, we just worry about the electrical forces between them. Uh, the gravitational forces are completely negligible. On the other hand, a black hole is precisely where gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. So that's a regime with extreme strong gravity. Uh, and amazingly, there's a connection between these two problems with very weak and extremely strong gravity. Um, so this connection is helping the community make progress in you know, what has long been one of the open problems in physics, uh, is the unification of the quantum theory of Schrodinger and Heisenberg uh, with Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, it's still not fully understood how that unification happens uh, in our universe, uh, but we are understanding in principle uh, that in fact, there is a completely logical and uh, self-contained way of putting them together. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this connection by a simple example, probably I think the simplest example uh, called the SYK model, uh, which uh, in fact describes both A and B. It describes a, a certain many particle system in class A and certain black holes, quantum black holes. And they turn out to have uh, by sort of a change of variables or duality, as I'll explain, uh, and they are ultimately related to the same same model. Okay, so so how is this ex uh, astonishing connection even possible? So the central actor uh, is the idea of quantum entanglement. Uh, so quantum entanglement was a feature of quantum mechanics, uh, which was uh, emphasized in particular by Einstein in 1935, uh, where he noted that it led to what he called spooky action. Uh, and so, and, and, and what this says is that objects separated by great distance can instantaneously affect each other's behavior. Uh, so Einstein explained how this was possible in at least the way the quantum theory is formulated. And he expressed such skepticism that uh, this is actually the final theory. Uh, there probably have to be some changes to the quantum theory to get rid of this feature that uh, he didn't think uh, made sense. So anyway, so this is a report in 2015, uh, an article in the New, New York Times of an experiment in the Netherlands uh, where two uh, particles, in this case photons, two lumps of light uh, about a kilometer apart could be entangled and in fact instantaneously affect each other's behavior. I think the distance apart is now is much larger. Uh, and, and there's really no question that this feature uh, of quantum entanglement uh, is not just you know, something that's eventually going to disappear, but, but really the heart of what quantum theory is about and some of the bizarre consequences, of, one of the bizarre consequences of quantum entanglement uh, is that it indeed, it leads to this connection between two very different looking systems. So uh, let me just explain uh, simply what is quantum entanglement. Uh, so I presume most of you have heard about uh, the principle of quantum superposition, uh, which you know, amusingly is referred to as you can have a cat that's both alive and dead. Uh, but more precisely, it's the statement that uh, distinct uh, physical states can be superimposed to each other. So, for example, if you send an electron in the famous double split experiment through two slits, uh, it can, in a way, go through both slits. Uh, so now if you just take this idea of superposition uh, to more than a particle, then you come up with the idea of entanglement. So as an example, just consider uh, a hydrogen molecule. So I'm just going to approximate the hydrogen molecule uh, by uh, two electrons, and I'm going to denote the electron just by 
this arrow, and the arrow representing uh, the spin of the electron is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. So up is, let's say, uh, counterclockwise. Um, so you know, in a single hydrogen atom, there's just one electron, and that electron, let's say, happens to be spinning, uh, uh, spinning up, let me say. But in a molecule, what we know is that uh, the situation involves some entanglement. And what this means is that you have two electrons now, and these electrons prefer uh, to have opposite orientations. So if one is spinning counterclockwise, the other is spinning clockwise. But uh, the actual state is not the state where the left atom is spinning clockwise and the right is spinning counterclockwise uh, or vice versa. It's really the superposition of both. It, both these configurations are part of the state that describes uh, electrons in a hydrogen molecule. And we represent this by writing you know, a sum between these states, this strange uh, cat symbol, which tells you represents a quantum state. So this is a state where the left electrons up and the right's down, and this is the opposite state. And the actual configuration of the system is both. Uh, and really, and one of the fundamental, so it's not a mixture of the two. And the difference is that before you measure the system uh, by some external apparatus, uh, it's not determined which state uh, the left electron is. Uh, and that's really the essence of entanglement. Now, what I, Einstein, this was, of course, known uh, in, from the early days of quantum mechanics. Uh, but what, what Einstein proposed uh, was a thought experiment. Uh, suppose I could take these two electrons and separate them really far away without disturbing their spin. Now, this is, in practice, extremely hard for electrons, uh, but it's doable for photons. Uh, and there, the spin of the photon is just their polarization. Uh, but let's just imagine we could do it for electrons and you have uh, one electron say in, here in Boston and the other in Ruki, uh, and you manage to separate them uh, after they were entangled in the past. So, you know, a few days ago, they were entangled in a single molecules and then you very carefully separated them without looking at the spin. And so the principles of quantum mechanics say that they're still entangled, uh, where both up, down, and down, up are possibilities. And, and now the, uh, the statement is that now if I, in my lab in Boston, I look at this electron and I see it's down, uh, then only, and then and only then is it instantaneously determined that the other electron is spin up. Uh, uh, and, and that's the bizarre feature of entanglement that uh, it's a, it seems like a highly non-local effect, but reality, what's non-local is just the state itself. You know, physics and the measurements and the results that you observe are all completely local. Okay, um, so that's a quick summary then of what is quantum entanglement. Uh, so now let me jump ahead to a completely different subject, uh, which is black holes. So what's a black hole and what does quantum entanglement have to do with black holes. So, uh, so black holes were originally discovered as solutions of Einstein's equation general relativity in the 1920s. Uh, and they were just viewed as uh, you know, theoretical objects, almost certainly not anywhere present in our universe. Uh, today we know that's uh, simply not true. Black holes are everywhere. Uh, this is a picture, a very recent picture of a radio, a radio uh, with radio telescopes. Uh, showing uh, 25,000 supermassive black holes in about 4% of the northern sky. Uh, and each one of these black holes uh, is at the center of a galaxy, uh, as big or bigger than our own Milky Way. Uh, and in, in fact, even our Milky Way has a, what's called a supermassive black hole at its center. Um, and this uh, each one of these black holes is a million to billion times the mass of our sun. Okay, uh, and there are much smaller black holes also around, but uh, these are the most spectacular. Uh, and so what the special feature of black hole? Well, it's an object so dense <coughs> uh, that light itself can't uh, escape. So Einstein's theory of relativity says that, you know, gravity acts 
uh, not just on the mass of the particle, as Newton said, but it also acts on energy. And light carries energy. So if you have a black hole with lots of matter in it, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Uh, then the gravitational attraction of the matter acts also on the light. And so if light tries to escape, uh, it will turn around and come back. So it's imp impossible in, uh, in the classical theory of general relativity for any effect, any physical phenomena inside what's called the horizon of the black hole uh, to affect what's going outside. So, the, so this is a part of the universe that is completely disconnected forever. Uh, in a black hole from the outside of the universe. Of course, things can fall in. Uh, and as things fall in, the black hole will grow because its mass is increasing uh, because there's a relationship between the radius of the black hole uh, and the mass inside the black hole. G is Newton's gravitational constant. C is the velocity of light. So if you just uh, use this formula uh, and put in the mass of the Earth, uh, you will get a radius of nine millimeters. So that's how dense it is. You'd have to take the entire Earth and squeeze it down to the size of a pea uh, before you'd get a black hole. Uh, but, you know, the supermassive black holes have the mass much, much, much larger than the mass of the Earth. They have mass uh, a million to a billion times the mass of our sun. Um, and their radius is also correspondingly larger, about the size of... Uh, I think the orbit of the planets in the solar system. Okay, so now let me put these two uh, pieces of physics together, quantum entanglement and black holes. So <clears throat> let me consider another thought experiment where I take an entangled pair of electrons, say in a hydrogen molecule, and now I separate them, uh, not between uh, here and Rurki, but between the inside and outside of a black hole. Um, and again, uh, quantum mechanics says there, if you do the experiment carefully enough, at least in principle, uh, this uh, electron inside is still entangled with the electron outside. And if principle, someone inside the black hole measures this electron, uh, that will determine the state of my electron outside. So this horizon, which was completely opaque in the classical theory, in the quantum theory has become uh, slightly less opaque. It's not completely opaque. Things are in, inside the black hole can in principle influence what's outside the black hole. Um, okay. And this particular feature that there's entanglement between the inside and outside of a black hole uh, was exploited by Hawking, although not precisely in this language, uh, to show that the black hole is not just featureless uh, sphere just uh, sitting in our universe. It's, it has a small temperature uh, and an entropy. So entropy implying that there's lots of degrees of freedom, uh, which is whose fluctuations determine the temperature. Uh, and, and the way you can understand this temperature is, uh, you know, imagine you're an observer outside the black hole and you have this electron with you. Uh, since you can never determine what's inside the black hole. I mean, uh, if, if you know your friend wasn't uh, unlucky enough to be inside the black hole and measured this electron, uh, that friend can never communicate with you and tell you uh, what's going on. So as far as you're concerned, the other part of the entangled pair is lost forever. So since it's lost forever, uh, this, uh, this electron in your, in your hand uh, is essentially random. So it has it's either up or down completely randomly. Uh, and that's exactly what a temperature is. The temperature is a measurement of the randomness uh, of the microscopic degrees of freedom. So because of the entanglement across the horizon, uh, to outside observers, it will seem as if there's an actual temperature of the black hole. So this is really somewhat different from ordinary temperature and entropy uh, in a glass of water. That temperature and entropy is due to the random motion of the water molecules. Um, here, this is an entropy that's coming, it's much, it's a quantum effect. It's not present classically, uh, and it's coming entirely from entanglement. Okay, at least at very low, you know, you can, of course, uh, black holes can have a real temperature, but this is a quantum temperature 
uh, which is just determined uh, by, by entanglement. So this temperature is called the Hawking temperature, T sub H. Uh, and the entropy I'm going to call S sub BH for the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, because actually it was Bekenstein a bit earlier that postulated uh, that uh, black holes should have an entropy. And one other thing that Bekenstein also postulated, uh, which Einstein made more precise, was this remarkable fact that the entropy of a black hole uh, is proportional to the surface area. Um, so this is uh, another very astonishing fact here because you know people have of course studied entropy in thermodynamics for decades, centuries, uh, including quantum systems. Um, and if you study these quantum systems, which are not near black holes uh, and have very weak gravity, their entropy is always proportional to their volume not to their surface area. So black hole seems to be this uh, rather remarkable object uh, where the entropy is proportional to its area, surface area, not to its volume. Uh, and this is intimately connected, of course, with the fact that the entropy is a consequence of quantum entanglement. OK, so this was the shocking proposal of Bekenstein, uh, which I think it's fair to say nobody really understand what it meant. Uh, and then Hawking uh, confirmed it by a more specific calculation, but still, uh, even that calculation left, uh, you know, was far from a complete theory of how quantum mechanics is affecting uh, the behavior of a black hole. Uh, and also had this remarkable feature that the entropy is proportional to the surface area. So we'd like to do much better. Uh, and understand the entropy of a black hole and as part of some complete theory of the interplay between quantum mechanics, entanglement, and gravitation. So how would you do this in principle? So this is, sorry for the seemingly scary formula here, but really it's very simple. Uh, so this is what's called a, a path integral in quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is a way of computing the thermodynamics of quantum systems. So the way you compute it, uh, according to the Feynman's prescription, is you take the set of all possible classical paths. So if you were doing the path integral of a particle going from point A to point B, you would think of, classically it would go along some specific path. Quantum mechanically, you say that it doesn't go on that specific path. Uh, it can go any path. And you have to sum over all the possible paths for the particles to go from point A to point B. And you sum over all these complicated set of paths. Each path comes with a certain weight. Uh, and that weight is what's called the classical action of the path, which, uh, which is this funny S symbol. And you divide it by Planck's constant. Uh, and the reason you have to sum over all possible paths is very much, of course, related to uh, superposition and entanglement. Uh, the particle can really be not just two places at the same time, it can be really everywhere. Uh, and you have to sum over all the possibilities. So that's uh, the basic feature of quantum mechanics. So if you try to put that together with gravity, now Einstein has told us that gravity is really about the dynamics of space-time itself. Space-time, the curvature of space-time uh, are the right degrees of freedom to express gravitational forces. In the same way that Maxwell taught it earlier that the electric and magnetic fields is the right degree of freedom to understand light uh, and uh, electromagnetism. So we want to write down a quantum theory. When you write down a quantum theory of electromagnetism, we sum over all possible configurations of electromagnetic fields. So in exactly the same way, when we write, we write down a quantum theory of gravity, we have to sum over all possible metrics of space time. Okay, so quantum gravity is a summation over all possible configurations of space time itself. And each weighted by a factor, which is the exponential of Einstein gravity divided by Planck's constant. Uh, but, okay. Uh, but this summation uh, is really a very challenging uh, thing. No one really knows how to do it. Uh, and what but Beckett and Hawking said, you know, took a don't worry, be happy approach. Uh, simply said, well, let's just take 
the leading term, which is the saddle point where this action uh, is, is a minimum in suitable coordinates. And when they did, they did that, the leading term, uh, well, what happened here? Uh, leading term, oh, it's correct. Uh, in fact, gave exactly the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So this is the work calculation by Gibbons and Hawking uh, that gave us the leading, the, the same answer that Hawking had obtained earlier by other arguments based on uh, uh, quantum entanglement. Uh, so, so this, okay, so this is some uh, meaningful result, gave further confidence in the Bekenstein Hawking results, but it, but there's no idea how to complete this, how to compute any corrections and actually even evaluate the full path integral, uh, where you just approximate this quantum theory by what you just postulate uh, is the leading term. Okay. So, you know, so we can't confuse this because uh, of the very, very large number of configurations of space time. Uh, and there's lots of fluctuations, including fluctuations of topology of space time. Uh, and no one knows really how to, how to control this in general, even today. Uh, okay, but in recent years, for certain cases, uh, people have learned, physicists have learned how to complete this equation. Uh, the, the earliest way that people have learned how to do this is using string theory, where you take the theory of gravity and you, you put it in many higher dimensions with lots of supersymmetry, uh, and you get a very sophisticated mathematical framework, uh, which you can use to complete this equation. Uh, but we'd like to do this just for Einstein gravity, uh, not some fancy other theory that you think might be present in eventually at very short distances, but the theory that we know. Uh, and that has remained uh, an open problem. Uh, and what I'll tell you now is some, I think, very exciting recent developments where even for Einstein gravity, uh, we can complete this equation in certain cases. Uh, and, and this uh, will be done using the SYK model. Uh, and it involves a, a very deep and profound uh, new idea uh, that first came up in string theory. Uh, and that's the idea of holography. Uh, which is connected to the idea of duality. Okay, so what is this idea? So what we've seen uh, is that black holes have this strange feature uh, that a black hole in D space dimension uh, has its entropy proportional to its surface area, which will be D minus one dimension. Whereas if I take a quantum system in D space dimensions, its entropy will be proportional uh, to its volume. So the idea of holography, very simply stated, is that well, if you that maybe you can relate a black hole in D dimensions to a which has lots of gravity to a quantum system without gravity uh, in D minus one dimensions. So perhaps there's a connection. Perhaps you can map uh, the theory of uh, gravity in D plus one space-time dimensions or D spatial dimension and one time dimension to a theory without gravity in D minus one spatial dimensions. Uh, and what this connection would involve uh, would be a duality. There's some very complicated change of variables. In one set of variables, your theory looks like a theory of gravity in D dimensions. In another set of variables, it looks like uh, a theory without gravity in D minus one spatial dimensions. So this is, uh, you know, sometimes called a hologram. A uh, black hole is represented by a hologram, which roughly speaking is sitting on a surface. A uh, hologram is a two dimensional image of a three dimensional object, which preserves all the information in the three dimensional object. It's not just a projection. Uh, you can, from the two dimensional image in a hologram, reconstruct the full three dimensional object. Uh, so in the same way here, these are completely equivalent systems. This is a complicated change of variables where you take a system in three space dimensions, a black hole in three space dimension, and write it uh, as a hologram without gravity in D minus one dimensions. So this, uh, and this mapping, if it exists, uh, would be remarkably useful because the right-hand side of this equation, we know how to evaluate. We can you know, we, we've studied such systems a lot. Uh, and, and so then maybe you can go backwards and understand what's going on on the left-hand side. 
So string theory first gave an example of this remarkable feature. Um, well, there's a famous work of Mar de Sena. Um, and what I'm going to describe is a much, much simpler example, uh, which works, in fact, just for Einstein gravity. OK. Um, however, before I get to that example, uh, I need to describe one more feature that's needed about this lower dimensional quantum many body system. It, we know it doesn't have gravity, but can I take any system? You know, can I take, you know, the electrons uh, in uh, in copper as some many body system? Is it somehow a hologram of a black hole? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, and so, what is the other requ important requirement? Well, to understand the other requirement, I have to think a little bit about black holes out of equilibrium, which are not yet just sitting there at some temperature. Uh, and that can happen, for example, when you have the merger of two black holes. And in fact, that's what was detected by LIGO in 2015, uh, when two black holes merged to form a single black hole. Uh, and that set off gravitational radiation, which was detected in LIGO. Uh, so we can ask, you know, how long does this process take? Well, of course, it depends initially on all kinds of initial conditions. Uh, but there's a very large stage of it called so the so-called ring down stage, where you simply have the analog of earthquakes, some waves that are going uh, around the black hole, uh, which propagate for a while, but then they settle down uh, and damp out and decay away. So there's a ring down time associated with the damping of such modes, which was actually first computed by uh, Vishveshwar in India, uh, which in Einstein theory is around eight pi gm over c cubed. So for this particular black hole, that's about eight milliseconds. And uh, so that hasn't really been detected in these pictures. So let me be clear about that. But let me take this time uh, and notice what seems like just a numerical coincidence at this point. Uh, I can take this time and compare it to the temperature that Hawking computed. Uh, that was in 1974 after Richard had done this work. Uh, and what you'll find is that the ring down time has a very much simpler expression in terms of the Hawking temperature. It's basically Planck's constant divided by Hawking temperature. Uh, KB is something called the Boltzmann constant that's only needed because we measure temperature in strange units of degrees Kelvin or degrees centigrade. If you measure temperature and energy, which is the way to do it, uh, then you wouldn't need KB. So it's basically Planck's constant divided by the Hawking temperature. And this is actually known to be true for many, many black holes. Um, they ring down in this time. And this time, uh, when you think in terms of other systems relaxing to thermal equilibrium, uh, turns out to be a very short time. So black holes are champions uh, not only how dense they are, they're also champions in how quickly they thermally equilibrate uh, in this very, very short time, which is just Planck's constant divided by the Hawking temperature. Uh, so just remember that expression, that's going to play a key role in everything I'm going to say from now. Okay, so therefore, uh, here's another very important feature of black holes. They ring down or relax to equilibrium in this Planckian time because the only thing I need to know is the temperature and then Planck's constant is of course the same everywhere in the universe. So now I can refine my requirements then. If I want a, a many body system to represent a holographically a black hole in D dimensions, a quantum many particle system in D minus one dimension, uh, you know, having this dimensional mutation will, will solve this problem uh, because the volume of this system will be the surface area of that system. So this problem is solved. And I want to solve this problem. So well, since the dynamics of whether, you know, whether one side of the mapping is, when one side of the mapping is thermal equilibrium, the other should be two. Uh, so therefore the quantum many particle system should also relax to equilibrium in a Planckian time. And now this idea connects directly to things I've been working on for several decades. Uh, this is exactly the kind of quantum many particle systems I've been thinking about because of completely different requirements, because of their observation in certain experiments. Uh, and uh, 
And so once you, so this is what we need to do. Find a many body system, which at a minimum, it's not a sufficient requirement, but it's a necessary requirement. You want to have a many body system that relaxes the equilibrium in this time. And this turns out to be the shortest possible time. And no one's ever found a system that's any faster. Okay, so let me give you then uh, uh, the, the first system for which now it's provable that this happens and that's the SYK model. So, uh, but before I get to that, uh, uh, let me tell you what's going to be really key to the SYK model. So as I said, let's take some more familiar many particle systems. You have you know, billions and billions of electrons in a piece of wire uh, that are repelling each other and moving around. Uh, and so that's a many particle system. Uh, is that somehow a hologram of a black hole? Uh, as I said, the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because in some sense, the entanglement uh, is limited in, in ordinary metals. And one way we understand that is as the electrons are moving around, they of course repel each other and feel each other. Uh, but after a certain distance, the electrons really become independent. And they become independent, not as a bare electron, but what we call a quasi-electron. It's an electron with a few uh, dust of, you know, uh, vibrations of the nearby electrons included in it. So this quasi-electron, a quasi-particle as we call it, uh, is just a lump which looks like an electron. It has the same charge and the same spin as the electron. It may, have, it may be slightly heavier, but really you can think of a metal uh, as essentially independent quasi-electrons moving through the wire. So as these quasi-particles move around in a wire, they're not totally free. They eventually have to collide with each other. And it's only those collisions which will cause the wire to then eventually uh, reach thermal equilibrium. Uh, if you, you know, once you, if you heated it up or you put some energy into it and then the electrons collide, the quasi-particles collide and the system becomes reaches equilibrium. And you can ask how long does this take? So that kind of calculation, you know, is something you do in a, a quantum many body course. Uh, and, and the basic result uh, is that that time is always at low temperatures, much longer than the Planckian time. And reason being of course that the fact that there's limited entanglement, these particles just are able to you know, live for a long time and it takes a long time for the system to equilibrate. Uh, and so there's just not enough entanglement to have this rapid equilibration. All right, so finally, let me give you an example of system that satisfies the minimal requirements uh, and that's the SYK model. And unlike string theory, this is something I can really completely describe in a few pictures in a few minutes. Uh, so it's again, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, a model. It's just a, a, a thought experiment at, at this point, mostly. So imagine that you have uh, a bunch of sites uh, and on these sites, you put in some fraction of them with electrons. So I just represent by an electron by their position. I won't even draw their spin. Uh, and these electrons, they occupy these sites. Now I want these electrons to move around uh, in corner mechanically. And corner mechanically, they move by a process of uh, tunneling from say hopping from here to there. Uh, and in general, if I really took a bunch of impurities in the metal and I, and I generically had electrons sitting on various sites, uh, they would start moving around independently of each other. And uh, and then you would get a quasi-particle description, and in fact, uh, not uh, really uh, anything that would equilibrate very rapidly in the requirements I have. But in this model, we postulate that the electrons can never move on their own; they can only move in pairs. That's that's really the only thing. So, for example, this pair of electrons uh, can move there and there in pairs. Since you can't tell which is which, they're identical, it could be the other way. And so then they move. So this is a what we call a tunneling process with electrons that move from one region to the other. And it occurs, in quantum mechanics tells us for every such process, you associate a certain amplitude for it. You give it a complex number that tells you uh, 
how often that process will happen. The probability for that happening is the modulus squared of that complex number, but you don't want to take the modulus squared, yes, because under quantum mechanics, you have to take all possible motions, add them up and take the combined amplitude and then take the square. Uh, so now, so these two electrons have moved, so you have some amplitude for that. Uh, and then say this pair of electrons will move from here to there uh, or vice versa, and that has some other amplitude. Uh, and every time this motion happens, those electrons are in, in a sense entangled because they are both the initial and the final state. They are superposition of both such states. Uh, and now this is many particle entanglement because different pairs of electrons are uh, randomly getting entangled to other sites. So for each one of these process, I have to associate a complex number. And that complex number would be something that would depend on, you know, all kinds of details of your physical system that you may have made in the lab. Uh, you'd have to compute it, it'd be just given, uh, depending on the, you know, these impurities and everything else. And if I gave you a set of numbers and said, okay, tell me what happens, uh, we can't. Uh, it's just too hard a problem to sum over the exponentially large number of possibilities once the number of electrons becomes larger than about 20 or 30. Uh, we can't possibly tell you what's going to happen. However, uh, in the SYK model, we say, okay, uh, anything can happen, it does happen. Of course, that quantum mechanics says that's how it should go. And you have to associate with any such process a, a complex number. So what we say is just pick a number at random, toss a coin and pick a number. So for every such process, you pick a fixed random number. And that's it, that's the complete description uh, of the SYK model. Uh, you have two particle hopping, uh, each associated with a random amplitude, uh, simple as that. And it turns out, uh, amazingly, this is one of those cases where randomness helps, uh, even though with a fixed set of numbers, I couldn't solve the problem. Uh, if I give you a random set of numbers, you can use certain features of random numbers to solve it for a given system. You know, even if you, I don't have to take an ensemble of systems, I could just take one system of a million particles and it can tell you with some high accuracy, the properties of every site and the pro many of the properties of the system by, by the solution of uh, the SYK model. All right. So this, so this is just a way of building in by having only two particle motion, lots of many particle entanglement. So this, this is one of the, in fact, the simplest example of a quantum system that has complex multi-particle entanglement. And one of the consequences of this is that the quasi-particles, which are the, you know, the bread and butter of our description of all kinds of uh, materials in the lab, uh, at least in this material, this object, they don't exist. Uh, there are no quasi-particle excitations, uh, meaning you can't think of high energy states as made up of elementary excitations of, uh, of these set of electrons. And furthermore, if you try to figure out, when I perturb such a system and ask how long does it take before it becomes indistinguishable from a thermal state, amazingly, it is the Planckian time. So it really equilibrates in the fastest possible time. So these are things that are in fact possible to prove uh, for this model. Uh, of course, I'm not gonna do it here, but uh, I have a, I'm giving a graduate course on many body physics right now, which you can follow on YouTube. Uh, and at the end of the course, we'll, we'll prove some of these things. Uh, okay. All right, so then I've given an example, at least on the face of it satisfies all the requirements uh, that I've postulated for it to be a hologram of a black hole. And the question is, is it true? Uh, this model was something I proposed in 1993, a variant of this model. Uh, and at that time, even the idea of holography didn't exist. Uh, and the connection to black holes was not something I even dreamed of. Uh, but in fact, the answer is yes for a certain black hole. It is in fact exactly dual to a very specific black hole, which I'll now describe. So what we have to consider uh, is a black hole that has not only mass, but charge. So it's got, you know, say excess of electrons or say excess of protons over electrons. So it has a net charge Q. 
Now, in terms of the actual black holes out there in the universe, that's probably highly unlikely. Every black, you know, if there's a, more protons than electrons, then some electrons will come in from somewhere in the galaxy and neutralize them. Uh, but in principle, these are solutions that are stable if you have a net charge. And the physics is that the, the charges, like charges repel. So if you had a bunch of like charges, uh, they want to just flow apart, but uh, they attract because of gravity. So if you can have a situation where the masses are large enough uh, that the gravitational forces balance the electrical forces, as can happen for black holes, uh, then you get a charged black hole, which is stable. And you want to take this black hole and go to very low Hawking temperatures. They can occur for a range of temperatures and you want to go to very low temperatures sometimes called the extremal limit for the experts. Now, these considerations also apply to rotating black holes. So this paper by uh, these people from TFR, Trivedi is the former uh, director of TFR, said recently, but I won't discuss that here. Okay, so now if you take, so this is a solution of Einstein's equations and uh, for gravity and Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism. Uh, sometimes called the Reisner Nordstrom solution for the experts. So if I take this solution of classical gravity uh, and I zoom in to the vicinity of the horizon, now a great simplification happens, which is very important for my description here. The theory of gravity, which is now a theory in three space and one time dimension, uh, kind of factorizes. There's a theory for the radial direction, which I'm calling zeta, which is one space. And there's a separate theory for the transverse direction, which I'm calling x. Uh, so if you're unlucky enough to be falling into this black hole uh, to meet your end in a few microseconds, very short time, in that very short time as you're following through, uh, you, will, you will experience that you're living in a one dimensional, your space is just one dimensional. You'll just have a this um, falling in this one dimensional region. Now for us theorists, that's, that's a great simplification because I can now try to think about quantum gravity uh, in one space in one time dimensions in near the horizon of such a black hole. So here's, I'll draw another picture of this black hole. Uh, so this X, direction X uh, is in, now opened up this way. And this is the radial direction zeta, and that's the horizon. Uh, and this radial, this direction x is shrinking. That's one of the part of the curvature of space time uh, to the horizon here. And this symbol tells you, uh, before I get to that, and this horizon then would have, by the rules of Bekenstein and Hawking, some entropy, which I'll call SPH. So now, why, you know, that's the leading answer of Hawking and Bekenstein. We want to determine the corrections to that. We want to determine, you know, what about near the horizon? Uh, there's quantum corrections there. I have to sum over all possible space times. Can I do that? And of course, the answer in general is no. But because this particular space time has this peculiar feature that it's three dimensional outside and one dimensional close to the horizon, this AVS2. Uh, if I focus on just what's called the near horizon region, uh, then this path integral over all possible space times can in fact be done. And, and this is uh, one of the achievements of uh, a number of people, a small number of whom I'll mention in the, in the, in the upcoming slides. Uh, okay, so, so if you can actually, for this charged black hole, actually complete the program that Hawking uh, and um, Hawking set out to, to do in the uh, mid 1970s. Uh, Gibbons and Hawking, sorry. We can complete that whole program. Just for Einstein gravity, we can evaluate the full path integral over all possible uh, configurations of space time. And the reason we can do it is because of this fact that in the extremal or low temperature limit, this uh, gravity from three plus one simplifies to gravity from one plus one. All right, so now I have a system in one space in one time direction. Now let me uh, apply the idea of holography. 
holography tells us that the spatial dimension, if I want a hologram of the theory of gravity, it should be in zero space and one time dimension. And I've already told you a model that's in zero space and one time dimension. That's the SYK model. The SYK model had no sense of space because you could hop from anywhere to anywhere. It's just it's really like a dot. Uh, so it's a zero to zero dimensional object, which has no quasi particle excitations. And amazingly, it turns out this is an actual identity uh, that the partition function or the entropy, the free energy, all the various things that physicists like to calculate, you can calculate it on both sides of the equation uh, using Einstein's theory of gravity and using the quantum degrees of freedom uh, of electrons, and you get the same answer. Okay, so that's the remarkable result. Um, so I had proposed that there may be, there was this, such a connection. There may be, I think, uh, from fairly circumstantial evidence in 2010. Uh, nobody pays the slightest attention uh, until I was amazed to then see this work of Kitab in 2015, who, uh, who uh, you know, actually proved it to a much greater accuracy than I even anticipated uh, that this connection uh, uh, exists. And today we understand it. In, in substantial detail, uh, especially if I refer to this recent paper of Elias Lesu and Turachi, which explains all the details of it. Okay, so to summarize then, the near horizon theory of one plus one dimensional gravity along this zeta direction is exactly the low T limit of the SYK model. And another picture of it, so now I've told you about the SYK model, the charged black holes, and at low temperatures, they become the same theory of quantum gravity. Uh, in one plus one dimensions. Uh, and, and you know, and these are not black holes in some fancy T of gravity, they're black holes in Einstein gravity in three space dimensions. The only kind of unphysical feature they have as far as actual physical black holes is concerned that they have a net charge. But there are possibility, it's possible that they're out there somewhere. Okay, and the reason this connection exists um, is because both the black hole and the SYK model are, have complex many particle entanglement uh, with the Planckian time relaxation. Okay, so now I've completed uh, one part of my, uh, no, two parts of my title. My title mentioned uh, a simple model. That's of course the SYK model. I mentioned black holes. I haven't said a word about superconductors. Uh, so I think I have about five minutes left. Is that correct, Alok? Five, maybe 10. Can I take 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about superconductors? You, you can even take 15. Uh, we, are, we are okay with that. Okay, all right. Please. Thank you. All right, so now I'm going to talk about superconductors. Um, there, as you'll see, there is also a connection to the SYK model, but it's it's not as precise as the charged black hole to the SYK connection. It's a um, it's more like a toy model, which is helping us understand uh, these materials. So in some ways, these superconductors are more complicated uh, than these black holes. Okay, so the particular superconductors I'm referring to are are what so-called high temperature superconductors, uh, yttrium, barium, copper oxide. Uh, is the prime example. Um, so it's a, it's a ceramic. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, this is its uh, uh, atomic structure. Uh, it's rather complicated, but it turns out you can simplify things a great deal. Uh, the electrons tend to move in planes. Uh, and on those planes, they tend to stay on the copper sites, these orange sites here, which form a square lattice. So really, you're, it's a problem of electrons moving around on a square lattice. It's really as simple as that. And that turns out to be a remarkably rich uh, playground for all kinds of new physics. Uh, so here's a, so if you take this material uh, discovered in 1987, and uh, you dump it in liquid nitrogen, and that, that's that little cake has been dumped in liquid nitrogen, uh, then, uh, and you put it over some magnets, well, a superconductor has the property that it doesn't, it expels all magnetic fields, uh, and that's why it can float uh, over magnetic fields. Of course, it crashed because I, it had heated up, and it's now 
uh, above its critical temperature. If you kept it cool, it will keep going forever. And they can also conduct electricity under suitable conditions with exactly zero linear resistance. Uh, all right, so, so those are, you know, and that was really, it was only in 1987 that you were able to first do an experiment of that type. Uh, previously, all the superconductivity was discovered in 1950, 1911. All the earlier superconductors, you know, had to be cooled to much lower temperature, which required a whole lab and with lots of uh, you know, liquid helium and other things to cool it down to temperatures much cooler than liquid nitrogen. Uh, but now you can do it, you know, it's a high school experiment. You can just do it with a flask of liquid nitrogen. Uh, and the key ingredient in these materials, as I've already mentioned, uh, is the square lattice of, uh, of copper atoms. And what you control when you make these crystals is this number X, which determines the density of electrons on the copper sides. So there's some very sophisticated chemistry that people have been working on to improving to control the density of electrons uh, on, this, uh, on this lattice. Uh, so what, so how does roughly the thing work? So if at a certain density, this material is in fact, not even a conductor, it's an insulate. And, and that's the density where the density of electrons is such that there's exactly one electron for every site of the copper lattice. So every site here, uh, represents a copper atom, and in fact, a certain orbital in the copper atom. And these are the electrons represented again by their spins, uh, some pointing up and some pointing down. Uh, and in fact, in this material, uh, this uh, well, picture of lanthanum copper oxide, which is a closely related material, uh, the spins form this checkerboard arrangement where half, uh, like on the black squares of chessboard are spinning in one way and those on the white squares of the chessboard are spinning the other way. And you can see this by various experiments on uh, using neutron scattering, uh, that this is what the electrons are doing. Uh, another feature of these electrons is an insulator because uh, the electrons can only move by, by hitting another electron and that costs a lot of energy. So they're basically trapped uh, and they don't move and the spins orient themselves in this way. So this is, you know, a beautiful state, but it's kind of boring in the sense of quantum entanglement because the electrons, uh, neither are they moving and neither are their spins entangled. They're just in this configuration. But if you remove a few electrons, uh, density P, then you have some vacancies. And the moment you have these vacancies, then all kinds of things can uh, break open. The electrons can move around freely. And what happens in fact, uh, is you get a superconductor. So you go from an insulator, the worst possible conductor, to the best possible conductor just by changing P. Uh, and uh, okay, so, so what happens now? So these uh, electrons are the holes can move around and there's an amplitude for that we call T. Uh, and then they can also exchange their spin with some amplitude we call J. And this defines something we call the TJ model rather than unimaginatively. And this simple model, uh, I guess emphasized really in some very important work by Bhaskar and Anderson, soon after they discovered these materials, uh, we believe has all of the complicated physics we need to describe this remarkable phenomena and the entanglement of these electrons that ensues once these holes uh, start moving around. Okay, uh, more of those pictures. And what happens as they move around? Well, on the horizontal axis is the density of electrons and the vertical axis is the temperature. So if you're at zero density, no holes, and then the system is an insulator as I just discussed. And this AF means anti-ferromagnetism, the checkerboard arrangement of spins. Uh, but as you decrease, increase P, if P is bigger than about 0.05, uh, then suddenly the system starts to move uh, and becomes a perfect conductor superconductor in fact. And this happens up to rather high temperatures as high as 100 Kelvin. Uh, the boiling point of liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. So there, uh, at least at this doping, you can do that experiment in liquid nitrogen. So that's called the optimal doping where the TC is as high as possible. All right, so those are the basic phenomena, but 
uh, discovered already in 1987, 88. Uh, and since then, there have been many, many experiments exploring not just the superconductor, but also this region above the critical temperature. And what has come about from this region here uh, is you know, some really interesting physics and many mysteries that still remain to be understood. So, so when you heat the superconductor, if I take a more conventional superconductor like aluminum uh, and I heat it up above its critical temperature, it becomes an ordinary metal. And that ordinary metal uh, is described by quasi-particles, just like I explained a few minutes ago. Uh, and that happens in this superconductor if you do that, uh, at high values of P. This is what we call a Fermi liquid. This is a system with quasi particles. But at lower doping, uh, slightly lower doping, you get something called a strange metal. And really, this is what I want to focus on. I, I won't say anything about this pseudo gap metal. What is the strange metal? Well, what people have done is studied this in various ways. Uh, this metal that's a precursor. So it happens at optimal values of P for superconductivity. So somehow there's some bizarre metal which has in it the ability to go superconducting at a very, very high temperature, much larger than was ever seen before. So there must be something, you know, what to understand the superconductivity, we must understand its parent, where it came from, uh, and its parent is the strange metal. So we really need to understand this. Uh, and so what is this strange metal? Well, it's turning, it's, it, it will turn out to be our strongly interacting uh, many particle system with similarities to the systems I've talked about so far. So let me just show you uh, a recent experiment. There'll be many other, this is one of the cleanest. They measure what's called the angle dependent magneto resistance. Uh, okay, uh, so roughly speaking, what that means, as you can see from the words, is you apply a magnetic field, you measure the resistance in above TC, uh, in the presence of a field and you change the angle of the field relative to the plane uh, and you see how the resistance changes. And from this uh, data, which is rather complex, you can read off something about how the electrons are colliding with each other uh, and how quickly they equilibrate into thermal state. And that, so you can read off the, what's called the scattering time, tau. And what you find is that there's a certain component of the scattering time, the so-called isotropic scattering time, uh, which is in fact Planckian. It's exactly uh, the kind of times I told you about in the SYK model um, and, and black holes. It's Planck's constant divided by temperature. Uh, this is one over the time. So this is a rate that experimentists like to measure. Uh, so one over tau is a linear function of of temperature and also it has a number of order one. So it's this Planckian behavior that's so remarkable. And to us, uh, that's a smoking gun that there are no quasi particles. Okay, so from this, I'm not going to immediately conclude and I don't want you to conclude that this, this particular strange metal is a hologram of a black hole. It, it probably isn't, it's a little more complicated than the SRK model. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there are common features that we are working on to understand what's going on. Uh, so let me just tell you, conclude with uh, some recent work very quickly with uh, uh, my colleague Antoine George in, at the Flatiron Institute of New York, my student Henry Shackleton, uh, and a postdoc uh, at Flatiron, Alexander Vitek, and also some other work uh, that I won't mention, but I mentioned these people. Uh, Maria Tikhanovskaya, who's my graduate student, how you go is also my graduate student, and uh, Grisha, who's a postdoc uh, at Harvard. So what we're going to take uh, is this TJ model of Bhaskaran and Anderson, which was on a square lattice. And people, we'd love to solve that model, uh, but we theorists have been trying for 30 years to solve it, and we made a lot of progress, but still, uh, it's not complete. So we said, okay, let's just, simplify so that we can solve it. And you recall what I showed you with the SYK model. What I showed you with the SYK model was, uh, if you make something random, it becomes easier. So we say, okay, let's make this uh, model random. 
and maybe it'll become easy enough to solve. Uh, and maybe by making it random, you will still have the same basic physics uh, that you won't throw out you know, the baby with the bathwater by making everything random. And, yeah, and that hope seems to be realized in some of this recent work. So let me show you what we did. We just took, instead of putting these sites, copper sites on a, uh, on a square lattice, we just put them in randomly. And moreover, we allow electrons to hop, not just nearest neighbors between any pair of sites. So the electrons hopping around with the amplitude T and the spins are exchanging with an amplitude J. So this is a random DJ model. So we can solve this numerically and by a bunch of other methods. Uh, and uh, what do you find? Uh, I won't explain this data. Sorry for showing you actual data from a recent unpublished paper. Uh, but let me just say in words uh, what, what we find. So what you find at low values of P uh, is a spin glass. So the spin glass is the analog of that anti magnet. Uh, I showed you for the square lattice where the spins were in the checkerboard arrangement. Well, here it's not a checkerboard, they're in some random orientation. So they're kind of frozen in a random orientation. But then there's a critical point above which it becomes an ordinary metal, just like you see in the, in the, in the cuprates. And finally, there's a critical point where you see Planckian dissipation, and even as this peculiar linear frequency dependence, which we can actually relate to directly to the graviton properties uh, of the black hole. I, I didn't emphasize that. I, I showed this boundary graviton between the one plus one and the three plus one dimensional limits. Uh, turns out at least for this random TJ model, which is you know, about as physical as we can get uh, and solve, uh, you do get, in fact, uh, some signs of uh, quantum gravity, uh, even for this model that I just showed you. So this is uh, something very excited about. This is just a recent paper that is about to come out in physical review letters, which you can see on the archive. Uh, and we can even understand why this is happening in certain limits, why it looks like SYK, uh, some earlier work by, with these people. Okay, so that's the end of my talk then. So I've really ranged, talked about a wide range of topics, uh, but they all have a common feature of complex many particle quantum entanglement. Uh, and the simplest realization of that in a model that we can actually understand in some detail uh, is the SYK model. Uh, and this SYK model is the hologram um, of 2D quantum gravity, one plus one D quantum gravity, which is in fact, the physical situation in the other horizon of a charged black hole. And why are this random TJ model? Uh, there appears to be at least some connection uh, with the realistic copper-based superconductors. Some features of the copper-based superconductors, including the existence of a pseudo gap, the strange metal, the Fermi liquid, Planckian dissipation right near the critical point, uh, we can reproduce uh, in this random TJ model. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, if you take away anything from my talk, it's that uh, complex multi-particle entanglement uh, in quantum systems is extremely rich and leads to very bizarre physics, including Planckian time relaxation and holograms of black holes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sarste, for, for the lovely talk. Thank you so much. I think uh, let's all have a round of applause uh, for Professor Sarste, please. Thank you. Great. Uh, so I think um, uh, with your permission, Um, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You're, okay, uh, you're muted, so yeah. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so let's see. Um, okay, so uh, so there's a query by Deva Malia Mokopadhyay, and it says, uh, 
In a region near the event horizon, gravity is very strong. That causes a, a highly curved spacetime. And uh, therefore, as he says, the relativistic regimes are a matter of concern. How particle states are defined in that region? How do particle states in flat spacetime work then? Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, we don't, you know, you're asking about effectively what is the wave function uh, of all the particles in a black hole right near the horizon. Well, uh, and all the gravitons in the other particle. I don't, you know, I certainly don't have a, any clear understanding of it. Uh, but if you change variables to the hologram of these other particles that are hopping in randomly, uh, then we, yeah, then we can describe it, and uh, by solving the SYK model and just the equations of you know, you, but so there's a complicated duality then between uh, the nature of particle states in the SYK model of the microscopic degrees of freedom in the particles in the SYK model and the degrees of freedom of a black hole, uh, which involves you know not just gravity but curved space time but fluctuations of space time quantum fluctuations of space-time along with uh, matter fields. Uh, so that's a complicated object. I don't think we have any clear understanding in those degrees of freedom what the wave function looks like, but we can make progress by this uh, holographic procedure. Yeah. All right, uh, so there's a, qu a query by Gopal Yadav which says, what kind of interaction is playing a role between two entangled objects which are far away? Ah, great question again. Uh, there is no interaction. That's the point. Uh, so, so what happens? I mean, the, the key thing, uh, feature of entanglement, uh, that's counterintuitive, but which you have to accept. Uh, it's not that there's some action at a distance, which is what Einstein called it. He called it spooky action at a distance. How can there be some force or some something that goes instantaneously from one part to the other? you're giving up what seemed like one of the basic tenets of uh, physics, which is locality, that uh, what's happening here in my room only depends on things nearby. Uh, well, in fact, we don't quite give that up. What we do have to give up, however, is the concept, is the idea that the concept of a quantum state uh, is local. So what's happened is that you have these two entangled electrons and they share, they're part of the same quantum state. In fact, all of us, the whole universe is part of a single quantum state. Uh, and you run into difficulties if you somehow say that the quantum state is a property of one electron or the other electron. It's not, it's a property of both. It doesn't live here or there. It's just a state, you know, that's all. Like it's, it's almost, you know, maybe you can find ideas in Indian philosophy which correspond to this. So there is a state uh, which describes both electrons. And it's neither in my room nor in Rurki when I move them far apart. It's neither inside the black hole nor outside the black hole. Uh, it's a state that's shared by both. So when I measure one of the particles in my lab, when I see it, then I'm disturbing that state. But since the state is a property of both, the other, other particle um, also changes a state. In fact, what's happened when I look at something is that the entanglement even grows and then I myself am entangled with the two electrons. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, okay. So, uh, and, uh, so there was a query uh, again by Deva Malia and uh, it says, uh, uh, you talked about entangled particles being generated in labs. Could you please explain how two particles can be entangled experimentally? Is entanglement also a naturally occurring phenomenon? Oh. Well, I'm getting a wonderful question. Yeah, absolutely, it can create it in the lab. It, it is a natural looking phenomenon. Like I said, uh, every hydrogen molecule has entanglement in it. Uh, these copper-based superconductors, all you have to do is just make crystals, grow it in a lab, and, uh, and look at it in this temperature regime, and there is entanglement in there. You can't control it. Uh, it, it is what it is, naturally. Uh, the whole idea of quantum computing these days is to make a entangled system in the lab where you control the entanglement, where you actually decide, okay, I'm gonna make this particular entangled state. Uh, 
And so you can do that, uh, you know, in, in quantum computers, you do it, you by taking some very carefully uh, prepared objects you call qubits. Uh, and all you have to take is uh, these qubits and have them uh, interact with each other uh, in any way. You can couple a wire between them, anything. Uh, and once they interact, they will be entangled. So in this experiment that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, <clears throat> This one here, uh, <clears throat> um, they entangle two photons. And the way that get entangled is you, you arrange things so that and these photons were emitted from the same atom. So somehow you have a situation where atom admits two photons, one this way and one that way. Uh, there's some electrons here moving around in the atom and they emit two photons. And, and if, they, if that two photon process happens in an instantaneous, then the two photons are automatically entangled. So entanglement is present everywhere. It's just that it's so complicated and random that we don't see its effects. So you have to carefully prepare it and study very special properties to see its effects. Uh, yeah. And also, let me also mention, excuse me, Uh, when you get an entangled pair, like in this uh, experiment where you separate the two particles from each other, uh, it, the reason the entanglement is, you know, physics is still local, is there had to be a time in the past uh, where they were next to each other. So these two photons in this experiment also, even though now they are 1.3 kilometers apart, in the past they were right next to each other. And that's when they got entangled. It's just that you, if you take a system that uh, the entanglement doesn't change uh, as they move apart. But normally that's not the case. If I just do an ordinary experiment and I entangle two degrees of freedom and I move them, the entanglement totally change. So what the hard work here is not creating entanglement. The hard work is making sure <clears throat> it doesn't change when you separate them. That's what you have to prevent entanglement to create this, EP, this pair of electrons that are far apart, three pair of photons that are still entangled. You, entanglement is everywhere. It's just that it gets totally scrambled uh, once things start to move apart from each other because they interact with everything else. So you have to take these, in this case, the photons and make sure that the photons don't hit any other atom as they move apart one kilometers. Now for photons, that's actually quite easy to do because light doesn't interact that strongly with matter. Uh, but for two electrons, this is a much, much, much harder experiment. You couldn't do this with two electrons because electrons interact with everything. Uh, it's not so easy to make them move apart and not you know, feel the air molecules or something like that. Okay, uh, so there's a question by Vanshaj, uh, which says that uh, if we say that we have the thermal temperature as uh, let's say order one or one in units of energy, then the ring down time uh, uh, becomes uh, Planckian, uh, the order of the Planck's constant. So how do you measure such a number? Uh, well, I mean, this number for, you know, for room temperature, if I take, or take a low temperature, like a few degrees Kelvin, uh, it's in the terahertz. Uh, and, you know, so you can do a terahertz scale experiment. You'd need uh, some kind of infrared laser with the terahertz scale laser, which we have now, uh, and detect dynamics on that scale. You, you have these pump probe experiments that people do on the terahertz scale. Um, so really it depends on your temperature. Uh, if your temperature is around, you know, liquid helium or liquid nitrogen, then it's a scale that's difficult to access, but accessible. Uh, in this particular experiment uh, that I showed you where they measured uh, the Planckian time, uh, that was kind of an indirect interpretation. It's not directly a time-dependent measurement. Whoops, go through my whole talk here. Uh, yeah, in this experiment where they measured uh, this, this time, uh, this was a DC experiment. Uh, so it involves some interpretation. You had to put in, you know, do some uh, calculation from the angle dependence of making it resistant to read off a time. So you could question, you know, how well they've done that. 
so this is not the, it's a great experiment, but it's not perfect from that perspective. Uh, so you'd have to do a different experiment on this time scale. So this is, I guess here it's picoseconds, uh, you know, 10 picoseconds. So that's, you know, with certain sophisticated pump probe lasers, that's an accessible time. But I think for the cube rates, that's quite a difficult experiment to do. <clears throat> All right, uh, so there's a question by Lai Chi Long uh, and the question, uh, um, not very sure what it actually is supposed to ask, but let me just ask it the way it has been asked. What is the difference between the topological picture of quantum gravity and the entanglement holography of quantum gravity of black holes? I'm not sure what you mean by the topological picture of quantum gravity. Uh, so there are certain theories of gravity that are pure topology uh, and they also have holograms but they're much much simpler because the topological gravity has very few degrees of freedom. Uh, here I'm really talking about systems that are described essentially by Einstein gravity which has lots and lots of degrees of freedom, uh, physical degrees of freedom not just topological. Uh, it has gravity you know it has a boundary graviton at least in the one plus one dimensional example. Uh, and in that case, you do need this Planck in time behavior. I don't think you get Planck in time behavior in topological gravity, but I'm not an expert, so I could be wrong. Yeah, in fact, I, I recall uh, coming across a paper by uh, uh, a group, uh, I think it was a Cornell Fudan uh, University collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly, I think they, uh, the authors, uh, they try to. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, they, they try to uh, study entanglement holography in topological strings. So uh, uh, for those of us who are familiar with the concept of topological strings, we know that there are two varieties of so-called uh, the, the, the topological the type A and the type B. And uh, so uh, they, and uh, for the, you know, uh, recently there has been this so-called generalized entropy uh, uh, functional. Uh, and uh, so I remember the authors claiming that they are calculating, they gave a prescription of actually working out the entanglement holography for uh, resolved conifolds, which are basically target spaces for uh, one of these um, uh, so-called type A uh, topological strings and they do something. So maybe uh, Lai Chi could have a look. Uh, if I remember, one of the author's name was Gabriel Wong. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. This is a paper last year. Anyways, so okay, thank you. But this is well beyond my expertise. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. I mean, this is uh, this is a casual comment. Uh, that's all. Um, so okay, so there is a query by Ankit Jha, and the query says, if one of the two entangled pairs of particles is taken to a high gravitational regime, such that time dilation is taken into account, while the other is kept in normal conditions, do they still remain entangled? If so. When a measurement is made, uh, do the particles communicate not only across space, but also across time? Uh, first part of the question is the answer is yes, they remain entangled. Uh, the second part, I would, uh, I would be careful. I wouldn't use the word communicate. They're not really communicating. Uh, they're entangled, uh, but for true communication, uh, you know, I need to know what the state of the second particle is. And if I'm outside and I have one of the particles with me, I don't know the other state. I don't know if anybody's measured it. Uh, so that person, whoever measured the other one uh, would have to communicate with me by ordinary subluminal uh, uh, communication. Uh, they couldn't do it from the inside of a black hole, uh, but if they were still outside, they could. And, and, and that, sub subsequent communication where they tell me what they've measured would experience time dilation. All right. Uh, so there's a query by Ayush Kumar. It says, can the phenomenon of entanglement be associated with degrees of freedom other than spin? Also like entangled pairs, can we have, <clears throat> excuse me, entangled triplets or quartets, et cetera, uh, higher order configurations? Uh, if so, what can we say about their behavior? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 you know, sometimes we call uh, such entangled triplets or quartets or uh, as, in, as cat states, because 
And that's precisely what uh, Schrodinger's state, <laughs> the cat, which is both alive and dead, uh, is entangled between those two states. Uh, so the point, of course, is that whenever you have large degrees of freedom uh, with some very carefully prepared entanglement, like between a live cat and a dead cat, uh, it's extremely hard to preserve. Uh, any, any simple perturbation on any constituents will destroy it. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's highly, you know, it's highly unstable. And, you know, ultimately that is also the big issue in quantum computing. A quantum, when you do a complicated quantum computation, you are creating an entangled state of many, many particles. Uh, and you have to do active quantum error correction to have any chance of making that entanglement survive. And that's not easy. Okay, uh, I, I'm pushing your throat uh, a tad. I apologize, but there are so no, many No, I'm fine. Ways. I'm fine. I'm glad to continue. I'm sorry. It's just, I need okay. to stay in order. I'm thank perfectly you, thank fine. You. Really appreciate that. Thank you. So, um, so okay. So there is um, so there's a query which says, uh, um, is the strange metal state uh, related to spin liquids, spin glass systems, and the behaviors in quantum Hall effect? and fraction uh, quantum Hall effect. This is a, a query again by Lai Chi Long. Uh, great question, yeah, no, that, that is precisely the type of question I spend my waking hours on. Uh, <laughs> I think, yes, there are connections. Uh, there are definitely connection between uh, spin liquids and fractionalization and what's going on in the strange metal. You know, so spin liquids are certain uh, more exotic states where you have the phenomenon of fractionalization. I very briefly mentioned that at the end, but didn't explain it in any detail. So you can have the situation, you know, I told you about how an electron moving through a metal is a quasi particle, it's a quasi electron. Well, sometimes this quasi particle can split into two, uh, where one part carries the charge of the electron, the other part carries the spin of the electron. So these are called the fractionalized particle. So this kind of behavior you know, now it's reasonably well established in insulators. We understand how this fractionalization can occur. Uh, but fractionalization in metals, like strange metals, uh, is not at all, you know, completely understood. That's in fact, the my topic of favorite topic of research these days. Uh, and so combining fractionalization physics with metallic physics uh, is I think a really interesting topic and probably will be needed to fully understand uh, the high temperature superconductors, uh, and uh, and it's also is connected to certain fractional quantum Hall states. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a query by uh, Yu Li, uh, and the query is: Does the random TJ model develop some sort of a conformal window, or at least in some limit, does it become a CFT? Uh, well, it, it, we don't know yet. I mean. Uh, there is a certain large M limit. So this, this critical behavior here, uh, there's a lot of evidence from the numeric that there is a conformal behavior. Uh, whether it holds all the way down to zero temperature, we don't know. Uh, in fact, it almost certainly doesn't because there's a very weak logarithmic instability to spin glass order. Uh, but I think there is, and that's what this plot was showing, uh, some kind of conformal SYK-like behavior including corrections to conformality uh, over a fairly appreciable regime of window of frequencies and temperatures. But uh, that is exactly the topic of our current papers. And uh, we, there's, you know, so I'm quite excited about that. And even a simple model like random TJ uh, has this feature. Okay, uh, I'm not sure about this question, but I'm gonna ask it the way it has been asked. It says, does it work? Uh, I'm not sure what the it is uh, for a charged black hole. This is a question by Sh uh, Sharang Ayer. Uh, does it work for a charged black hole, an SYK model because both have a few charges? If yes, what will happen if all the charges for a charged black hole is inside the black hole and not on the surface? Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, let's, let's see what's happening here. Uh, let me go back. So I think I know what it means. So there's this connection. So I made this connection uh, between a charged black hole and the SYK model. 
so the reason this connection works is because of this dimensional reduction. So there is uh, a reduction from a three-dimensional theory of classical gravity to a one-dimensional theory of classical gravity. This is a property purely of Einstein's equations. Well, I don't know who discovered it, but it was it was a feature, for example, of the Reisner Nordstrom solution, uh, which was discovered, I think, in the 70s. Uh, okay, so this is a feature that's special to charged black holes. If I take neutral black holes, this three to one reduction doesn't happen. And then once, you, since you don't have the one, uh, you can't go from, you can, you know, when you have one here, you can go from one to zero because the SY came out as zero. Uh, you can't go from three to zero directly. Now, there is another case where you go from three to one to zero, uh, and that's the case of this rotating black hole and this paper by Boyd uh, that discusses also a similar dimensional reduction in a rapidly rotating black hole. And this is probably actually more likely to be physically realizable. There are lots of rotating black holes out there. <laughs> Great, I think uh, with that, uh, we come to the, uh, the end of um, uh, the session, uh, this incredible session. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Sajdev, uh, especially with your patience, uh, for your patience. Oh, no, 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 it was uh, just, uh, just uh, I can see that uh, uh, the questions were really terrific, right on, right on on point and I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Professor Mishra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Sachdev. So with this, folks, we uh, come to the uh, conclusion of today's uh, uh, session. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, uh, I thank once again, Professor Sachdev for uh, 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 kindly agreeing to, uh, to uh, be a part of the series and giving this beautiful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. So, bye. Good bye. evening. Stay safe. Yeah. <laughs> A very good morning to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. So, okay. So I think uh, with that, I'm going to be ending the meeting. Uh, I pray that we have filled up the response form, though. I wonder if there were any reminders sent for that uh, uh, feedback forms. If you can, please do so. Uh, so we'll meet again uh, next Saturday. Until then, bye-bye. Stay safe. So team, I'm ending the meeting. Thanks once again. Thank you, sir.